John. What? Red 7. I don't know what Red 7 means. Hot route. I don't. W what is hot route? Will you just go stand on the other side, please? Down. Come on. Ready. Down. Set. Hut. 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 Hit me. Booyah. Oh. That's what we call a sack lunch. Nom, 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 nom. It's time for the Soonerscoop.com postgame show presented by Eskridge Lexus in Oklahoma City. Eskridge Lexus is the official travel partner of Soonerscoop.com podcasts. Now, here's your road crew, Jerry, Eddie, and Bob, wrapping up all the action and reaction from this week's game. All right. It is the final Eskridge Lexus post game show of the season. That's unbelievable. It is over the season like none other that we've experienced before. And a bowl game like we haven't experienced in a very long time uh, is over as Oklahoma beats Auburn, or Auburn, Florida. <laughs> it's late. Uh, 55 to 20. Um, it felt familiar. And the last thing that I remembered was oh, you putting a beat down on Auburn, but it wasn't this bad. And. That Auburn team wasn't as bad as the Florida team we saw, especially defensively tonight. But, boy, uh, you didn't really know what to expect. You thought Oklahoma had uh, the edge in this thing just because you knew the opt-outs were there, and then you started hearing kind of more about the defenses, uh, defense being uh, having some opt-outs and having maybe some COVID situations. Uh, and it was a very depleted Florida team, but give it up to Oklahoma. They went out, built that 17 nothing. I mean – you can't ignore the fact that they intercepted Kyle Trask three times in the first quarter tonight, regardless of who he was missing. Kyle Trask had turned the ball over five times this season. He turned the ball over three times on the first, what, four possessions of the game? Just an incredible performance from top to bottom. It was the most complete game that I think I have seen an Oklahoma team play. I don't want to say something crazy, because the 2017 team was obviously really good offensively. I mean, it, it's been a long time. I'd have to think about it for a second. But, that I mean, that was – it was an ass-kicking. And special apologies for Dan Mullen for having to take time out of his Wednesday night to come down here and coach a team that he didn't really want to be around. What a, what a prick he is. Now, I've, I've read his transcripts. I didn't hear him or see them. Did he come off that big of an ass? Well, I mean, the, the quote that I saw that really pissed me off was uh, – Something to the effect, and he throws players under the bus, but it was something to the effect of uh, the 2020 Florida Gators right. final game was yeah. 11 days ago. Right. Like, get out of here, dude. I read that, and yeah, I mean, he is, look, that is your SEC coach right there. Oh, it's, it's just That's arrogant. That's your, it's arrogant. I don't know if it's arrogance, it's just that they look for any way to not take blame for bad things happening. <laughs> like, because really he has is. to go down to that meeting with the other 11 or the other 13 coaches and make excuses about why he got his ass whooped. Well, and it's it, it's their third loss in a row to end the season. Yeah, too. they, lost three, season they that, lost three games in a row at the a end season. A season that started out so promising. They literally benched a Heisman finalist tonight. I mean, are we going to call it a benching? I, I think... I think they might have had that plan to just kind of like, look, if Take it doesn't go well, it. yeah, we're going to get him out of there fast. The the first and the third interception, like the 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 uh, pick six to Trey Norwood, and then the one to Woody in the uh, end zone, they were just floated out yeah, there. They're bad passes. Like what? What? What is this guy? And then the one that Asamoa intercepted was just wildly inaccurate. I mean, those are that's one of those plays though that just Oklahoma defensively hasn't had in the last you know, a couple years. And I mean, and it's Woody almost to had another one. Yeah. And then wasn't there a Pat, Pat Fields? Pat one? Fields almost had one as well. That he could have had. It was just unbelievable. And I mean, just, just a, but the thing about it is, thing. here's the thing about it. And a lot of this is the fact that they, they kept bringing in the, uh, the other quarterback, but you look at like pressure that, Oh, was able, they didn't get a whole lot of pressure on, no, on Kyle trash. They had four, four tackles for losses today. Uh, they did, they had one sack. Nick Benito had a sack. And that uh, was that was one of those that was almost a coverage sack yeah. because he stood back there for a second and Benito had to work all the way back around to him. And they had five quarterback hurries. So it wasn't like they were just harassing the quarterbacks they, in the pocket all They night. did enough, though, to make it yeah. uneasy, I think, on them. I, I think the interception Woody Washington had in the end zone, that was a little bit of pressure in his face, and he just didn't get the ball out very strong. Yeah. 
No, it was, I mean, as soon as the ball went in the air, you could just feel it. You know, it's one of those while I was shooting and stuff. It was like you could feel that the the fans saw what was coming. They knew that Woody Washington was in shape. And, I, you know, I, it's, not, it's definitely not making excuses for Florida, but I do think that, you know, whoever it is down there, if it's Pitts or uh, Tony or, you know, whoever, they probably puts up a little bit more of a fight. Yeah, I mean, Kyle Trask's dad, by the way, on Facebook was unbelievable on Saturday night or Wednesday night. I saw I saw people alluding to it, but I didn't actually see what it was. Went he was down. basically just bitching about like we need guys that can catch the ball. We need you know, and then he was going after Todd Grantham. I saw that he was going after Todd <laughs> Grantham. Yeah. By the way, real quick, I think twenty five people have contacted me tonight and said that they really wanted a drunk pod, and I was planning on having a couple beverages. Mm-hmm. But we're in this godforsaken state of Texas, Dry counties. where they well, no, they don't serve beer. That you can't buy alcohol after midnight. So that's on me. I didn't prepare. I didn't come pl- uh, prepared for the night, and that's uh, that's my fault. So I apologize to everybody out there. We're doing this so late. Uh, well, we don't. I thought maybe we would have pro football focus grades, but we don't have anything at this point. I was hoping to kind of go over, especially defensively, some of the snap counts because. I got to say this about OU's defense before I talk about Florida's defense, which was <laughs> putrid. Um, OU tonight, Shane Witter oh my emerged God. as a legitimate linebacker in the future. He's a dude. Uh, I think everybody like thought it at the same time. At, at I think it was one of the possessions, and it was one of the early possessions in the third quarter. He made two back-to-back plays, and it was like, damn. And look, we don't know because the the receiver position was so decimated. But if you had to make a, a judgment call off of one game, Trey Brown was addition by subtraction tonight. I mean, just did you see the plays DJ Graham made over the middle, knocking I was, the ball out? I was, I was standing next to Caden McFarlane. We were shooting video, and on the uh, ball that he broke up, kind of came over the, mm-hmm. or underneath. It was that pass they were completing his, all yeah, night. Yeah, and I, I just turned to him, and we, like, said this exact same thing at the same time. It's like, that play hasn't been made by a cornerback in a long, long time at Oklahoma. And it was Asamoah that was making those plays earlier sure. in the game. Os- I thought Asamoah played really yeah, well in the first he half. He did. He, I mean, they definitely went out and set a tone. And, you know, I, I think even if you go back to uh, when it was 17-10, to 10, right after the Ramondre Stevenson fumble, the only bad thing that the running backs did on Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was a big stop to hold them to a field goal, 17, 13. And then all of a sudden Drake Stoops fumbles and he falls back on the ball. And, yep. you know, two plays way, later, Drake Oklahoma Stoops is 24, 13. It was pretty good tonight. He had a hell of a block on the McGowan yeah. long run in the uh, fourth quarter. We've had an interesting couple of days on the board leading up to the game with the whole Jaden Hazelwood thing. Like somehow. Oh, and then. We're Charleston driving down Rambo here today. And, and Drake Stoops have become the reason that <laughs> Jaden Hazelwood is not here. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on with Jaden Hazelwood. We, I think everybody has seen the video that was put out today. It's maybe one of the worst we looks. put it out there. <laughs> it's maybe one of the worst looks I've ever seen for somebody to opt out of a game and then is running full-on routes on air the day of the game. Yeah. Because he's trying to get healthy, I, that just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Well, and I don't. I, I got the sense that maybe the stuff about you know he's not feeling healthy kind of came from his trainer. Yeah. Well, there's. I mean, there are two very different like stories out there, aren't there? Yes. Like one side is saying, "Oh, everybody's cool with it," and then the other side is, eh, "This is just kind of strange." You know. I mean, it, look. And back to Dan Mullen in his post game, and Lincoln was even this a, a, a little bit because I asked him about opt outs. Mm-hmm. Do you have to expand the playoffs uh, to keep this from happening? And he said it's two completely separate issues. But I will say I did agree with Dan Mullen in that opt outs had not been a problem for them going to New Year's Six Bowls until sure. this year. Sure. And I think that you're going to see that across the landscape of college football. I mean, you're right. But I, I, we have to get out. We really do have to get out of COVID land sure. before we start saying that anything's a problem. I don't think anybody opted out because of COVID, though. I think people opted out just because of the shit year that they, they were been sick through. of. Yeah, yeah, they were sick of being under corn. Yeah. you know, like and it doing wasn't all a real bu- And I'll say this: Dan Mullen. I read his transcript. I didn't hear him because Lincoln was going at the same time. He reminded me a lot of stuff that Bob Stoops would say, which is, you know, the bowl games 
are a lot of times we he was like we went to the Orange Bowl is the first time a lot of these guys ever yeah. saw the ocean. Yeah, like bowl games are kind of like, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, studying abroad a little bit. Like you get yeah. to see things and experience things that you've never got to experience. Well, let's before. be honest. Like the first couple of days of a bull trip, well, at least for the media is, I mean, drinking. You go out, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the players don't go out a whole lot. Like I remember the horror stories that they always told about Bob and that first bull practice when you get on site, he'd run your ass until you threw up, and it's just it's different nowadays. It well, truly but is. but I mean, I I think the whole thing is bowls are a much bigger reward than they were this year like the sure. bowls were really unless you're playing yeah you get for you, a national title bowl is just an, an away game yeah yeah this was that this, you could get hurt in this year sucked it, it sucked to be a player like in the, the tyler the wallace trip. thing maybe that doesn't happen if they're playing at the valero alamo bowl and they've been there for nine straight days i just thought that was the weirdest like i they can say whatever they want to say it's don't you think it was the king getting hurt in Maybe a little bit. Him probably going and saying, "Look, I I'm done here." And like, I really like Tylen Wallace, but if that's and I've never been in this spot, so I guess I can never say that I would make this decision. But it's like a ten point game. I don't know if that's the first thing that pops into my mind. Have receivers taken over as the softest position? Oh, there it's the most drama filled, softest position. In are they softer than kickers? Softer than power forwards, I know that <laughs> power forwards in the NBA. I mean, it's it's bizarre. It's, it's really they're they're divas a little bit, but and uh, they become bigger and bigger divas. And I think seven on seven might have something to do with that. Yeah, I I could I could buy into that. I could buy into that for sure. It was really weird, but I mean, it's like we were talking the other day about in Florida how physical it is. Yeah, yeah, it's physical because defensive backs. Basically, try and punch receivers off the line of scrimmage. Yeah, it's a that's, it's a fist fight to get open. It's actually a slap fight. Well, yeah, that that's true. That's true, especially down in Florida. Nobody's you know close fist and punching people off the line. It's not like when you watch offensive and defense. Remember that time when DJ Ward oh, yeah. got almost got his soul smacked out yeah. of him. Like yeah. that's I mean those are, those are big bodies going against each yeah. other. Get the I mean that was basically that was basically a Russian slap fight that we watched <laughs> that day. <laughs> Now they're popular, but it was a Russian slap. It was like literally a guy just wailing, you know, just slapping J.J. Sure. Ward across the face as hard as he possibly sure. could. Sure, sure. And yeah. D.J. Ward just walked away. But, like, receivers and DBs aren't doing that kind of shit. No, they're just talking shit to each other. Yeah. I saw I saw uh, one of the Florida players try and go Buki into something tonight. Buki, who did not play bad tonight. How much did Buki play? Just overall, I, I like that. I think that's one of those PFF things that I'd like to see because yeah. I felt like he really. They played uh, dime a lot tonight. Tell you what, man the the between the the trio of Trey Norwood and then the two corners with DJ Graham and and Jaden Davis, Davis, I thought played, played pretty well tonight. as well. Yeah. And and then Woody Washington, the future of that that position looks really bright. I will say this: if if you were upset with the play, the, the the touchdown that they scored at the end, just look who was on the field. It was oh, it was the last of the last string. Tanner Schaefer got in tonight on the offensive yeah. side. Like they cleared the benches. I th- but oh, I mean that touchdown, guy, Chance thought... Sylvie was I think on the coverage. Oh, was he really? Brian Mead was out there on the field. I think. I mean, there were some people that just don't, but I think Eaton was out there. I was getting in position for the uh, for the trophy presentation, which. Created one of the greatest moments in Oklahoma football history with the Malcolm yeah, Kelly rap. That was pretty impressive. Uh, I thought David Awegu played really good tonight, yeah, too. Yeah, he did. I mean, they're young linebackers. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about their young cornerbacks. Their young linebackers yeah. are now becoming that next big wave no, I, I on mean, this I, team. The obvious thing is out there. They need to get a couple of the defensive linemen to come back, and it sounds like Nick Benito and Isaiah Thomas were at least hinting towards something like that no, tonight I think, uh, on Twitter. Isaiah Thomas actually said he was coming, He's coming back, back. But Nick Benito was the one that was kind of cryptic about sure. it but it it made you believe that you should I mean be if you can get positive. if you can get a Ronnie Perkins or a, a Perry on Winfrey and we'll talk about it for you know 7 months now until the start We've of the season never talked to Perry on Winfrey so there's no <laughs> chance you're going to hear us ask him well we will talk about him though yeah uh i mean the expectations are going to be about as high as i can ever remember and it's, I think a lot of it is going to have to do with the way that this season ended and the way that they were able to pick themselves up off of the two and one mat. And uh, I mean, one and two or one and two. Yeah, I wish they were two and one. 
probably be, They'd be covering playoffs, a uh, playoff yeah. game on Friday yeah. if that was the case. But it was it was a very impressive, dominant performance. And if have you taken a look at any of the post game notes? Like as far as the bowl stuff, I mean, they well, were announcing a lot of it in the press box. Fifty five points is the most. Fifty five points scored. most scored. Six six hundred eighty four total yards. I think maybe the most impressive stat of the entire night is uh, one of the ones that they sent out late was oh, you averaged ten point nine a carry. Yeah, and it's a Cotton Bowl record. It's a school record. No, no yeah, ten point yard carry. That's a school record in a in a bowl game. Yeah, and a, for a single game. No, ever. Wow. At Oklahoma. Okay, we got to talk about this Florida defense because the, they did the same play on that. Was that the Mark? I believe it was the Marcus Major touchdown, the last one. That was the same play where Jordan Evans' father summoned him to come to come home so they could watch tape together. And was he it could really? No, I mean you remember it was that sideline thing. Where the running back is there and you try and push him out just oh, softly yeah, 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 yeah. and he just yeah, ran yeah, right through him because yeah. they just I mean at that point Florida had quit it was embarrassing for I, them I thought the Samaj or the uh, Samaj uh, he looked like Samaj tonight I thought the Ramondre Stevenson touchdown was oh. even more impressive that was that was very I've seen Texas you know be soft like that before too that reminded me kind of of the the uh, C D Lamb. Five people around sure. him sure. running it into the Against end zone. Against Texas. And then the, I thought the Theo Wees was just like a casual trot into the end zone. He, and he there nobody touched him. He just it was like he just galloped through nobody touched him. Open fields I mean, that of was, gators. It was unbelievable. Nobody touched him. Nobody even like really came close to him. No. He was just so under control. And we can officially and he does I mean he he is a smooth runner. Like Yeah. He it's not like when McGowan <laughs> Broke in the open field. You knew. I've never seen someone break into the open field and show us that he has no confidence whatsoever that he's going to make it to the end zone. There was a point at about like the thirty, maybe the twenty-five. Is like, all right, he's he's going to make one last like ditch effort to push it into another gear, and he just couldn't get there. But there was no, there was no like. Usually, you'll see guys like cut across the field. Oh, like, he was start just cutting. straight line. He was just like, I have to keep going as fast as I can because these guys are going to catch up. with Well, me. we can officially say that Kamar Wheaton was scared off by Marcus Major, right? Marcus Major and Seth McGowan. Come That's on, why I mean, he didn't Marcus go to Oklahoma. Marcus Major, man, he was really good I thought tonight. he was excellent tonight. Like, he was what I thought he would yes. be as a, as a college running back. Now, I, I guess we do have to say, like, I mean, Florida defensively was oh, my God. putrid. Like, Ty Grantham has to get his ass fired, that's, right? That's How does Florida get that bad defensively? That defense? Shit, if people it, were saying about that about Oklahoma the last no, five years. I know. I mean, that looked. I don't. I don't know that Oklahoma's defense was that bad in 2017. I mean, I, I remember you talking about on the U40 this week about Najee Harris and how yeah. he just basically ran through Florida. You look at the numbers tonight, and like it's just incredible to see. Uh, Go look up Najee Harris's night in the SEC championship. I'm curious what he did compared to what OU did. It was one of those things too that. I didn't realize that Ramondre was having the type of night he had until they flashed it up on the big board. Mm -hmm. It was like 179 yards, and I was like, Because every what? time he was running, he was running for 40 yards yeah, or 20 yards. Yeah, he was 25 or... yards of carry. By the way, uh, Seth McGowan averaged 73 yards per carry tonight. Just unbelievable. One run, 73 yards. It's unbelievable. <laughs> okay, and guess what? I guarantee you, Charleston Rambo has, is, has a Suter Scoop membership. We got to apologize. I, I didn't really shit on him. I guess I have to apologize. <laughs> I got to apologize. You I'm and sorry, the entire Charleston. Board. But but that was but the it's guy. But frustrating because that was yeah. the guy that we thought he was. Where was be. that guy all year? Just I have no idea. Uh, Najee Harris, 31 carries, 178 yards, 5.7 a carry, two touchdowns. What was his receiving though? Because the they threw the ball up to him a lot. Uh, five receptions, 67, three touchdowns, 13-4 a uh, reception. Ramondre Stevenson makes him look. Of course, it's not the same defense. They missed uh, I, what Mullen said afterwards. If there was a uh, defensive lineman requirement, they would have fallen short there. They had to get a guy medically cleared just to be able sure. to have enough bodies to play. Whatever. Dan Mullen's a loser. I I don't. I, I you know this is just one of those things. Like I, 
after watching that Baylor Oklahoma State game, I really was like. I can see why people cancel. I can see. Like, Missouri would have been terrible if they would have played, I'm sure. What do you mean, Baylor? When Oklahoma State went to Baylor at the end of the year, they oh, were having yeah. all the COVID yeah, problems, yeah, yeah. and they just yeah. waxed their yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, I mean, it was an absolute But, no, I mean, as, as, as bad as Florida's defense was, I, we don't need to keep talking about it because it was awful. No, OU was, OU was very, very good. They tonight. were equally as good sure. on the other side. Sure. So, I mean, it's just, I mean, you could point to so many people tonight that played well. <laughs> I was thinking about this driving over here. And it's like, you could probably try and point out guys that didn't play well because so many guys did play well. Brian Meads, you know, one of the only ones. He I'm just. Gonna, I'm not going to down my guy like that, but that was. There was one play that was just so bad. It was against like the the third string quarterback mm -hmm. when he like out in the open field. Yep. He at least ran him down and made the uh, tackle. I don't think he did. Oh, he didn't? No, I, I thought he did. I got blocked out. I think out. he ran about 10 yards past him. Like, yeah, there was, was a moment where like, it was he, like, like he was he standing still. Him. I was like, oh God, that's okay. He probably, I wonder if he, what is, is he a junior? Is he a Richard junior? Mead? That's a good question. See a senior. I want to say he. Well, I, we know it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's why I was. I, I mean, I guess if you're a, uh, if you're a senior, maybe they tell him a. Hey. But I, you know, I mean, this night. Yeah, he's a redshirt senior. I did love the fans uh, in the the uh, the SEC chants that started ringing down. You don't get that very often, uh, and obviously because of the and you're the not going to get it very often no. from a lot of lot of fan bases, but you will from Oklahoma. There's I think just, Oklahoma fans really like doing that. Yes, <laughs> especially because of the the history. But if you think about it, it's like you know they lost to Georgia and Alabama, obviously. But but that's the thing. Like, they did beat you, Auburn, you, and they if, beat Florida. Now they're two and two, right? If you're in this part of the country. You'll sometimes sit and watch Arkansas games, and you'll sit and watch Texas A&M games. Well, you got to live around the people. Yeah, and, uh, you, you know, you'll watch Tennessee maybe. But I, I like watching SEC football, but it is ridiculous when the fans of the teams chant that so enthusiastically, and those are usually the teams like Ole Miss that haven't done shit. So why not? I think that's probably the biggest point of contention with everybody is just the fact that, like, do you see a Kentucky coach was, like, talking shit on Twitter tonight? No. That's not the Florida team that we played. Oh, uh, you can say SEC all you want, but that's not the Florida team. Like, who, who are you? Kentucky? Yeah, you're Kentucky. Like, I'm not going to make a Fine. big deal about it Fine, because Kentucky. I like Mark Stoops, but. Fine, Kentucky. Let's let's strap them up next week and see yeah, what happens. Yeah, like, schedule it up. Let's have you play Texas before you play us. <laughs> Because they'll probably embarrass you. Casey Thompson, a little therm throwing for oh, 500 yards. Good to see. That was cool. No, it was, uh, I mean, it was for for what everything was, and I think, you know, it's probably been written about, but for, for what everything was this year, that's, it was the perfect ending to a season that has just been so weird. And, you know, Lincoln Riley, after the game, part of what he said when I asked him about that stuff, you know, it is. It's kind of one of those. You can't help yourself but wonder, what would this team do against Notre Dame, Ohio State? The way like, they played they, tonight, they I would play love with to Alabama? see it. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Could they? Could they? Because there play were with like even as well as they played, and you know, obviously they pulled away in the second half. There's still a moment there where it's you know you get that third interception and you're driving. Uh, I think it was. Somebody had the big play. I think it, Ramondre really had a big run. Got the Cotton Bowl coming on. And it it just it, it was one of those things. It's like you got to score there. Go up 21 instead of kicking the field goal because then you let them kind of back in the game with the 17-7 and then you fumble. Like the second quarter still wasn't just the no. prettiest thing. Coming out of halftime. Coming out of halftime. three time, minutes. Florida had the ball. If they could have done something with it, it might have tightened everybody's sphincter. Yeah. And who knows what happens yeah. from that point. But – they traded punts, and then OU just decided to stop screwing around, and they put up two scores, and then they just kept slowly adding to it. Yeah. And then they realized that Florida was not tackling any longer, and all they had to do was run the ball. Even with Chandler Morris, just run the ball. I mean, Marcus Major just – he was averaging like 10 yards a carry on the yeah. uh, on the, that final drive, on the final, you know, real drive for Oklahoma. It was just incredible. But, I mean, it's like now we're sitting here rewatching the replay. Cal Trask completes the first pass. 
And then what happens? Next play, pick six. I was super surprised that I just didn't feel like his arm strength was very good. No, and we've seen good arms. I mean, Trey Norwood, he's playing. Why are you playing eight yards off the ball, Trey? Trey Norwood's another guy that I just, like, I remember. He's just a playmaker, dude. I remember going back to, uh, you know, I think it was a U40 or something right before the season started last year. I was like, I just don't think they're going to miss him that much. And then, you know, I remember Alex Grinch went on, like, that big tirade about, you know, how important he was going to be to the defense and all that kind of stuff. stuff. Yeah. And, I mean, he is just, he is a very good football player. He's like the one guy that came in there and everybody was like, oh, yeah, he's pretty good in practice and he's we like him. He's a teammate. We all like him. And then he started intercepting passes in a game and everybody was like, shit, he's doing it. I could do it. 11 takeaways in the last six games for Oklahoma this year. I mean, that's right at the the speed D mantra, isn't it? Yeah. The two two turnovers a game. game. Yeah. And obviously they won eight in a row. It's just, it's incredible. The the uh, I I still don't think that I truly have grasped like how how much this thing has turned around defensively. And I will say this too: just talking to Spencer Rattler after the game, and that just was watching his reaction that I've seen him all year. He is this is his team now. Yeah, yeah. He is now entering into that Baker. Yeah, kind of command of the team. I am leading this thing. Sure, we're you know, I and he. I think he does a really good job of not just speaking bullshit. Yeah, like he's honest. Like he assesses where they are if they're not there yet, and he's not just blowing smoke. There was uh, it was it was after the seventy three yard run by McGowan. You know, you could tell that he was really pumped up, and he went over and talked to. Uh, Riley on the sidelines and then he came back over to the huddle and there I'll put it up on the board because I got pretty good video of it but you could just tell like everybody looked to him uh-huh. and he you know of course they I think they ended up uh, settling for the field goal uh, didn't they score and then it was called back maybe yeah they had a hold yeah but anyways it was it was just like one of those moments that I was like that's this is this is his group this is definitely like moving into the future we're seeing it right before our eyes. Yeah, and you you do really feel that from him when he talks, uh, just the way he address. He just seems like their spokesman now. Yeah, for sure. And everybody kind of looks to him to what he's going to say. For sure. And I I think that's what's going to be interesting about the defensive side of the ball is who's going to be that guy if a Ronnie Perkins does leave. Well, here's the thing. I mean, you know, and Spencer I think is getting it, but he also has to be the guy that when the defense gets them up 17 nothing, that they don't take their foot off the pedal. Sure. They're not that team yet. Sure. And I know I think Spencer knows that. I, I mean, I, they, I mean that was the, what was like 41-16 to 16 in play differential there. Yeah. Because they had three picks. And yeah. Like, Florida, they were they were moving the ball up and down the field. They would just make a mistake, and I mean, OU would, take, it would there capitalize. Was, there was a point, I think, tonight where Florida had 14 first downs, OU had four. And OU was up by 14. Yeah. And it was just... Like I think they almost had how many yards did they end up with tonight? It was about four eighty or something like that. I think they had three hundred something at halftime. Yeah, I could look at go look at the cumes. I but mean, it, it just it was it was kind of a weird game, and then you look up and know he's up by thirty two, or he's up by thirty five. I mean, it was just it was incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, I'm gonna go to see if I can get back into the stats here. The other thing uh, defensively from the uh, postgame notes was that I thought was pretty interesting was just how well they played over the course of the back end of the schedule. And I think it's pretty obvious that people know. But OU held their last opponents to an average of 15.6 points. Uh, Kansas had nine, obviously. Oklahoma State, 13. Baylor, 14. Iowa State, 21. And Florida, 21 tonight. Here's how it worked out. In the first half... They went in halftime, and uh, Florida had 313 total yards to Oklahoma's 275. See, like the first quarter, it was, well, yeah, OU kind of started figuring it out. It was was pretty even the first quarter, second quarter pretty even, even at halftime. But after after the half, it was 409 for OU to 208 for Florida. And that's because they just started running the ball. It's absolutely incredible. I mean – 
Absolutely incredible. But you look at, I mean, and this is where Oklahoma, you know, when they really get it going is when they're about that, you know, in that eight, nine yards per play, every time they snap the ball, they're yeah. getting eight, nine, even when they don't get a completion. Yeah. That's what they were. Every yard, average yards per play, 10 and a half, like you said, highest ever in OU history, uh, highest in Cotton Bowl history. So it was just, and, and then average yards of completion, 16 point, what is that, six? And then average yard per rush, 10.9, yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, a first down every time they snap the ball, either run or pass. <laughs> Almost more than that. Yeah. And there, I think there was a play, uh, I think Stevenson had a uh, run early in the game that kind of set the tone as like third and 11, and he picks up 12. It just like, oh, you had an answer for everything tonight. And you know what? I, w- I was happy, who I was really happy for tonight after watching what he went through last year, even though it wasn't that terrible because, I mean, it wasn't like he had a, a Justin Broyles night, but Woody, for Woody Washington to bounce back from his bowl game last year. Uh, he's going to be really when good. When he really didn't know what he was doing. He's going to be really good. I mean, I, I, I think that I'm, I think I like DJ Graham more just because I remember him at camps more. <laughs> than than I yeah. do Woody, and that's probably unfair. But and those, both of those and, guys are going to be yeah. extremely good. And then you have you know just it, it's kind of like you said, it's like the Shane Widers of the world uh, making plays. You know, Marcus Stripling played a, a, a ton tonight. I thought Corey yeah, Robertson, Corey Robertson had, had a, nice had a really tonight, nice yeah. like quiet year kind of. And he's going to have to take that jump if somebody leaves. Yeah, you know, I mean, they really need Perry on Winfrey to come back if they yeah. want to be an elite defense yeah. next year. Yeah, I mean, they really do. Yeah. I mean, they could survive without uh, Ronnie Perkins if Jalen Redmond comes along. We talked about that in the pod this week. Sure, but uh, yeah, Whitney is such uh, Winfrey is such a key, and I just don't know. I, I you know, it it I, it's going to kind of be interesting here over the next. You know, for 24 to 48 hours, just for the fact that, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting that Riley pointed out they're doing exit interviews tomorrow, then they won't see him for 25 days. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of big decisions coming up. I, I'm just so happy for all those players that the season is over. I mean, I'm happy for all of us because it's just been such a grind. It's you, been such a different grind. Do you think that uh, tomorrow when they do those uh, interviews, they're like, yeah, you don't need to wear your mask. You're good. Probably, I mean, they were just like, you know, I'm sure they'll be like, look, wear a mask, you know. Yeah, but it's not going to go be out like and the, seek out COVID. Sure, sure, but it's not going to be like that. But it's not costing them anything if they get caught up in contact right, tracing, right? Or if they, I mean, you know, they just, it, I'm sure it's just been, it's almost second nature now. But just being in the facility, having to follow yeah. every single little protocol and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I'm sure they'll, those guys will go out and socialize more now and probably go to some bars and parties and just enjoy life a little bit. I think the Bulls, instead of giving them bull gifts, they should have just gave them an open bar the night after their game. They could be back in the uh, in the uh, college town, too. How about Austin Stockner playing tonight? That was... Uh, that was didn't play a whole lot, though. No, and you could tell that they were kind of easing him back in. I think it was kind of one of those, hey, you're not there yet, but you're medically cleared, yeah. and we wish we had another week to practice you. I think he was pretty pretty messed up yeah. from the uh, staph infection. He had a he had a sleeve over his leg. Yeah, the whole night he was. And like, of course, of course, the first ball that gets thrown to him there in the uh, red zone, you know, they go right at his leg, and it's I'm just sure it like like that at all. That's disgusting. <laughs> Carrie's leg or uh, Carrie's arm is. It's got pretty nasty. It it was like the Josh Heupel two thousand elbow for a while. Ooh. Like kind of looks like uh, I, think I burst my bursa sac. Ugh. It, this hurts worse though. My toe is just now starting to feel. Did I not tell you that I took a head dive into the yeah wall? Yeah. Okay. I think I didn't realize it's that finger. bad. Oh, I'm hurting. At least you don't have any uh, face injuries. No, that was the best thing. I remember landing. And just waiting for my head to hit like the corner of a table and mm-hmm. split open. Yeah, and when it hit carpet, you start feeling the the blood rushing down yeah. your face. When it when it hit carpet, I was like, "Wow, I'm I can't believe I survived that." And then I got up the next day, 
and realized there was blood all over the walls because I split my finger open and tore all the skin off my knee and my elbow. That's so gross. Every time I see those guys slide hard on the turf, it just hurts. It's like you need to start wearing the uh, sleeve the around pads, your house. Yeah, the little stick-on things. No, I mean, it, I there is a sense of relief unlike any other that I've ever felt with this game. And I, sure. it's like I feel it for the players and for Lincoln Riley. Yeah. Like, he can just he go can home now and release for a be little around bit. his yeah. girls and yeah. not have to wear masks, you know, everywhere they go. Well, even the families of the coaches and stuff, like, they can go out and be normal people. Yeah. You know, as, as much as, as normal as you can right now. And it, it they've was, just been, I mean, they've all been living such an extreme version of what we've all oh, been, it's just been weird. living in. I think for the first time tonight, though, is like, and I, you could tell, like, after the game how happy they were, obviously, but... It was just, it was like a the weight of the world had been lifted off a lot of people. I do think, and I didn't get to ask the players, as the players didn't, we didn't get a lot of time with the players. Yeah, it's just tough with Lincoln, the Zoom stuff. Lincoln did kind of hint like, God, we'd love to play, you know, some more. We'd love, we wish we, this was a tournament. Like, yeah, I guarantee everybody in that locker room. Well, they're just playing so well right would now. We just love a show. And that's the thing. It's like with this season, you don't have a spring football they were so young at so many positions, uh, especially quarterback. Yeah. You know, offensive line was the only – I mean, Marvin Mim, Mims comes along on offense. Uh, defensively, all the young defensive backs you've got. Um, it truly is amazing to think know, about. Perry on Winfrey. Like I mean, where this thing was. they had. Where this thing was after Kansas State and where it is tonight. Uh, really, Iowa State. I mean – I mean, it, and I, can st- I can still understand how they lost in Ames. I mean, we're two days – Eddie, we're two days removed from – People still be. I saw the thing that you tweeted. I can't remember who was it. Keegan that put that oh, out yeah. there. Oh yeah, yeah. About, about firing Alex Grinch. Yeah, Alex Grinch. Yeah. And I mean, people were openly hostile toward Lincoln Riley just oh, yeah. yesterday about his play calling still coming out of that Big Twelve game. Carrie, there was somebody on the board tonight that wanted. I, I distinctly remember at nine thirteen, that was like, I hope you guys don't let Riley off the hook for play calling tonight. Yeah, they scored the most. They scored the most points and had the most yards. In a bowl game ever at Oklahoma today, but there was a time, you know, when, when I know they were the turning thing. it over. I mean, the the most bizarre thing that happened was Spencer Rattler got he got goofy with the deep ball again. They went two straight just hail marys, basically. One was catchable, actually, both were kind of catchable. The second one, Theo Weiss missed. The first one, Rambo missed. Now, the first one, I was kind of out of position. I was going down from one end to the other. It could have been a P.I. That's what a lot of people were saying. Yeah, it could have been a P.I. I I mean, the guy definitely grabbed one of his arms. uh, And it was, you know, it it was a difficult catch. And I think the the Theo Weiss was even a better play by the DB. But you're still throwing two straight passes 40 yards down the field. When you're when you at that point they were still they were still at ten yards per carry for sure. Ramondre Stevenson and so Lincoln Riley comes back out puts puts uh, uh, both uh, uh, Braden Willis and Jeremiah Hall on the field and Ramondre Stevenson and you're like okay he's figured it out like he's going to start running and then Ramondre Stevenson fumbles yeah yeah and you're just like oh shit. which was weird because I you know watching it live I thought no way the ball came out. And then they showed up on the big board and said, yeah. It was just enough. one of those weird deals where he went down into a guy's knee. Creed Humphrey just tweeted out a uh, YouTube video. It's 3.22 in the morning, by the way. He just tweeted out a uh, YouTube video, and it's Dan... The the YouTube video, it's a minute, almost two minutes long. It's Dan Mullen wants a kick-your-ass mentality, is, is what it's called. And it's, a Dan, it's from a Dan Mullen press conference. I can't wait to see what this says. Hmm. It's from back in 2018. The social media show done by the Oklahoma players after the game. <laughs> I mean, my God. Did that guy even play tonight? <laughs> I thought it was going to be really funny. I was looking for him. He was like number 41. Yeah, I he think. was. He was. Uh, I, If he was out there, I couldn't tell I him. never saw him. I mean, and they had a they had a starting linebacker that was out. And he was the backup. So he was supposed to be starting tonight. Let's see. That'd be funny if he didn't play. I didn't look at uh, I didn't look at defensive stats for Florida. I gotta do that real quick. I mean, 
My God, I I could probably give you an idea of what it looks like. Hold on, I'm I'm, I'm right there. Uh, where are you? I'm going down and down. James Houston. And down and down. James Houston. One tackle. One forced fumble. And oh, that's so it. he he got the forced fumble. His his knee must have got the forced fumble. Not a bad night, I guess. I right? don't believe. I will say this: there were a couple players on that team that were just flat out pissed, and one of them was that. Uh, they started Gervin to... Dexter, that number nine, big old number nine. Yeah, which you know I don't like my DLs with single dumbers. Um, but he tried to start some shit on the sideline. Yeah, and that was like late in the fourth quarter yeah. too. Like, what are it you was doing, over. man? They were just embarrassed. Yeah, they. I mean, a... any of those guys that had any, anybody that played for that team that had any type of, just just guts. They were embarrassed. Yeah, and he was one of them. It had it. That, I I think when you have a max exodus like they did, it has to be hard to not necessarily get bought in. But I mean, everybody's not on the same page. But I think that's why Dan Mullen said the things he said. Well, Dan Mullen's a little bitch. I mean, you either have to paint it like we quit and this is going to hurt our program moving forward, or yeah, this, but saying the, stuff like the twenty twenty season was over eleven days. Saying ago. saying stuff that oh, you basically beat. Our JV is what he insinuated. Like that's completely throwing his players under the bus. I just think OU fans are fine with the fifty-five twenty win. Oh yeah, I I mean, there's no doubt about it. They should have scored again. That's just crying over spilled milk. It's kind of fun. (laughs) (laughs) So I mean, from here on, I think the one thing I keep thinking about is what is life going to look like in the spring? Yeah. What is life going to look like in the fall? Sure. Obviously, in the fall, we have a better chance for things to be closer to normal. Yeah, no doubt. But I I mean, I just have to think by this time next year with vaccines readily available, college football is going to be a lot more normal. No doubt. No doubt about it. I mean, I don't I, know if spring practice will be normal, but I think college football. I think college football regular season will be normal. And by the way, I I, I did see that uh, Caleb Kelly tweeted something tonight about September fourth, two thousand twenty one, which would be OU's opener okay. at Tulane. Okay. So, it I mean it's it's going to be a really interesting summer. Uh, I mean, a really un- interesting spring and then summer for Oklahoma, just as far as who you get back here in the next couple weeks. I think you know those decisions are probably going to have to be made. I know that uh, I had heard that the Senior Bowl was. Not necessarily forcing people into decisions, but hey, we kind of need to know what's gonna what you're gonna do because we're trying to get our game together. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you know I think OU's gonna have a pretty good idea, and I mean the expectations are gonna be really high. A lot I, of the Florida opt outs were playing in the Senior Bowl, were they? As was Trey Brown. So yeah, I think I'm not saying I I think those are really good guys. They do a great job. I'm not saying they're pressuring people, but I think agents might have been a go between. It was kind of like look. I know you want to play in your bowl game, but this the ske- this is not your fault, but the schedule is all screwed up. Sure. We really need to get ready for the senior bowl. Yeah, no doubt. It'll be interesting. I you know, the the I'm I'm particularly interested to see how like I don't want to say national championship or bust, and I know that there's a lot of Oklahoma fans that would say national championship or bust is every year, but realistically, they're as close to national championship or bust as I can remember. Going into 21. This is, yeah, this could be, now 2011, they were the preseason number one team. That was, remember, when they had the ESPN yeah. docu-series? Just, and yeah. it was it started out great. I mean, everybody they went, remembers who the quarterback was. Yeah, they went and beat Florida State. Uh, it looked like, and then it just all kind of started falling apart. They lost some, remember Travis uh, Lewis? Got broke his foot in the Oklahoma drill. Yeah. And then he came back for that Florida State game. And what was it? They ended up, they lost Oklahoma State that year because Landry kept fumbling it inside the 10 yard line. Yeah. I mean, and Oklahoma State was really good that yeah. year, too. I mean, Whedon and uh, Justin Blackman. And were that was incredible. also the year they lost to Texas Tech after the rainstorm. Yeah. Oh, Tommy Tupperville. <laughs> He's a senator now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've heard quite a bit about him lately. Probably too much. Way too much, yeah. Well, he's going to be... He'll be on all your TV screens here soon. Hope not. No, he will be. 
there's something brewing there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it, look, it was a weird season. It was, it was a really good season to win a cotton bowl like that, to be big 12 champions. I think the main thing that you take from this year is defensively, Alex Grinch appears to be building something that we haven't seen in a very long time. Depth, talent, speed. I, and I would also say too that like it, it seemed like the just kind of the way that Lincoln was talking about. We put up the the video on uh, the board already. It's in uh, Bob's story as well uh, from the post game stuff. But it it just seemed like I think everybody's kind of on the same page as far as coaching goes, and it feels like I'm not saying that like Lincoln and Alex Grinch have this like agreement that you need to go play for a national title before you take a a, a coaching job elsewhere, but. Mm -hmm it kind of feels like they're in agreement that they're going to try and build something here over, you know, the course of the next year, two years, and maybe give it their best shot to try and win a national yeah. championship. Well, and I think the one thing... And I think you, you kind of heard the players talk about it yeah. a little bit. Like, that's the most open that I've heard players talk, like, we were in a good spot to win a national championship, or we're progressing to be able to get to that stage. That was the first time that it, I think you could hear it, and I guess it's probably easier to talk about it when you win by 35 points. And I think that's something that's, you know, you remember coming out of that big win over Alabama and the Sugar Bowl. It was like the program had kind of hit the skids a little bit. It wasn't exciting. No uh, and the university kind of oversold their hand on that deal. Mm -hmm. I remember when Bob Stoops and they brought the trophy out during spring football, and I was like, this is not Bob Stoops. Yeah. Like, He's breaking all his rules about how every season's a new year, every year's a new season. Uh, just because you did something a year ago doesn't mean you'll do it again. And they went out and they had a disastrous season. He fired his entire offensive staff, brought Lincoln Riley in. Like, I don't think this is a we're back type situation with, with Texas. I mean, this is not some game that happened that you didn't expect to happen that cures a lot of ills in your program this is a sure. program that's been building toward this that has fixed a lot of the holes and strangely enough i mean running back without ramondre stevenson still a concern oh very much so if he comes back he pretty much takes care of the whole wheaton situation um it's and just and you know kitty brooks coming back that'll be interesting yeah uh, I don't but think, I don't, after tonight, I just have a hard time thinking that Ramadre Stevenson's coming back. You were pretty much like, as soon as you realized how many yards he had, you were like, oh, this means he's gone. I, I mean, when I saw 179, they're showing his ass up on the big screen, like waving to the crowd. I was like, yeah. And then as soon as uh, the game's over, he wins the most MVP. outstanding player yeah. for the offensive side of the ball. I'm intrigued, though, with uh, Marcus Major. And it'll be interesting if... Say, like, Ramondre Stevenson does come back. Where does that leave a Marcus Major? Now, I do I, I do say this. Don't let the Florida defense be the weird sure. back for the running back position. Sure, sure. Because sure. that was a horrific defense. Uh, oh, and, you know, another thing I, that probably needs to be mentioned, too, is Anton Harrison's. I, I don't know how he doesn't go into the spring being the starting left tackle. That's the one thing. Uh, that's the one thing that Lincoln really has to work on is roster management. Like, yeah. what do you do with the Brian Meat? What do you do with the Eric Swenson? There's going to be some tough conversations that have to be made, and you know, I I think that it's kind of what a lot of people are starting to realize or learn, kind of the hard way, uh, especially this morning. It's like the Jalen Conyers thing entering the transfer portal. It's it's just going to be different. The way that rosters are managed nowadays, it's kids are going to enter the portal. And, you know, this year's a little bit different than, uh, you know, anything that we've ever seen. But I think that... I just don't under... The part about the Conyers thing, I don't understand entering the portal when you've read... Coming off a redshirt season. No. It, something it, it, else very must weird. have had to happen. Or he got disgruntled with something. Or yeah, I don't know. he didn't like school. Or he broke up with a girlfriend. Or, you know, he just... He, socially, he wasn't enjoying it. Yeah. It has to and be And sometimes that happens. Sometimes yeah. you, it's just not a good fit. Yeah. Once you get to campus. And... Uh, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up. I got a text message tonight from somebody uh, that is close to the SMU program, and they kind of insinuated that they felt like he might be a Mustang with uh, Tanner Mordecai, but that'd be kind of interesting. 
if the NBA was in charge of college transfer rules, SMU would lose all of their recruiting slots, I think, for tampering. Skip Holtz don't care, man. Mm -mm. That's a, that's what they're building their program on. That's the new, like, you know, maybe, it used to be. Well, Garrett Riley's be, over there, too. I, maybe it's just yeah. an Oklahoma feeder school. Uh, that's going to be awkward, though, if Garrett's they need to taking build a, Lincoln's uh, players. They need to build a burger house in Norman, if that's the case. <laughs> no, but, I mean, that you know, uh, your favorite coach of all time, um, Bill Snyder. I mean, he he built his program in a sure. different way that people weren't doing it through JUCOs. Sure. Uh, and now that you know Kansas State's trying to do it a different way with evaluated talent, but SMU's come along and said, "We're a big city. We produce a lot of talent. Let's find kids that are unhappy at schools and bring them back home." I think it's genius. Yeah, I mean, it's a better route than taking, JUCO's right now. The way things are going. Well, and the way things are going, I mean. Two, three years, I don't know if JUCOs will be around. There might be a couple. But not the systems like there there have been. No, I mean, didn't Arizona two years ago just completely X their JUCOs programs out of existence? This year when they did that. That was just this yeah. year? <laughs> this year's felt like uh fifty years. So anyway, we're just kind of rambling on about other things now, but it's, no, it just it was it was a, it was it, as dominant and as satisfying of a performance as you can get in a uh, bowl game. That I I mean I don't think that even Lincoln Riley would have imagined that it went as well as it did tonight. By the way, uh, we talked about that there were MVPs on offense and defense awarded in the game, but uh, let's do this real quick because we're gonna pick just one. Well, if I can get my button gear here, uh, let's do this. Eskridge Lexus is all about embracing the best. That's why they are the official travel partner of the Soonerscoop.com podcasts. So it's time for us to recognize the Sooners best with our Eskridge Lexus player of the game. I just can't operate anything. I'm just horrible. All right. Uh, Eskridge Lexus been a great sponsor for us for uh, years now uh, for the post-game pod has sent us on uh, many a mission, both recruiting uh, and game day related. I didn't even bother him. Uh, by the way, I do have PFF grades, um, I believe, for Florida now. Uh, because you know what? I don't what? think they're going to be too kind. You know what? Uh, I forgot to do one thing, which is log in. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, if we're going to pick one player tonight, I think we know who it's going to be, right? Or are you afraid that's going to send him to the NFL? If we uh, make him the Eskridge Lexus I mean, post game podcast, I'll get a Lexus out of it. The game. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think we have to go with Ramondre Stevenson it, since his return. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I, we were talking about it just a couple, you know, I think on the U40 this week as far as the last two games for Ramondre Stevenson were kind of meh. You know, just like he, he was there, but he, he just didn't seem to have that power. I mean, and tonight he just was running through everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to keep going back to how bad their defense was because that kind of discredits what Oklahoma did. Sure. But at the same time, my God. Are you pulling up the Florida defensive grades? Because uh, I have I have, uh, I have, have Oklahoma's. I could do that. Um, Would you like to know who the highest graded defensive player on the football field tonight for Oklahoma was? I'm going to say, guess... Um, I don't think that you're going to... You don't think I'm going to guess it? I don't think you'll guess it. It wasn't Buki, was it? Brendan radley Okay, yeah, 77.3. Nick Benito, 76.7. Ronnie Perkins, 74.3. DJ Graham, 70.6 nice. was number four. And then Trey Norwood was number five at 69.6. Uh, and then Isaiah Thomas, right? And then Isaiah that. Thomas, yeah. And John Michael Terry played a lot tonight. John Michael Terry, Pat Fields, Brian Osamoa, and uh, DTY. John Michael Terry had... Top ten. Almost as many snaps as Isaiah Thomas did tonight. 38 for John Michael Terry. Uh, snap leaders, Pat Fields at 64. So he still really doesn't have a... Well, Woody Washington, actually, the most, 68. They're not afraid to leave him out on the field. Deshaun White, 52 snaps. That's a little surprising. Although he played really well tonight, even in the past game. 
It's like yeah, you said. I mean, name me somebody that had a bad yeah, night. Give on it defense. up to Brian Odom. I mean, he has that that linebacker core playing pretty damn well here at the end of the year. There's really not. I mean, I mean, OU just you could not oh, run the ball in Oklahoma Shane this Witter. year. Shane Witter had a terrible score. I know, and I thought he was. I thought he, we were giving him props. Now there was one time that I he got blocked about 25 yards down the field. <laughs> he's just gonna have to. I mean, he's just gonna. He's a little bit smaller. He's gonna have to learn how to use his body a little bit more. Uh, but you know. It is what it is. We saw what we saw. It was a very impressive performance. Uh, offensively, uh, I'll give you some quick uh, uh, grades there. I'm sure people want to know about the receivers, uh, who did what there. Marcus Major, the highest graded offensive player uh, on the night with an 88.6. That dude is going to be an absolute star. Uh, Spencer Rattler, number two, number three. This one kind of surprising. Uh, and maybe it's because you didn't really hear from him or see him much tonight. Adrian Ely at number three. It's probably the best way to do it, right? Yeah. yeah if you're a, if you're a tackle. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, number four. And then Seth McGowan, number five. Seth McGowan uh, only had six snaps. Six <laughs> snaps on the night. He had six snaps and over 100 yards. That's insane. But as far as the offensive line goes, uh, Adrian Ely, 57 snaps. Tyrese Robinson, 57. Marquise Hayes, 55, because he got hurt. Uh, s- Anton Harrison had 37. Let's Did see. Hayes just get rolled up on that one time? I think he might have just got some cobwebs. Because yeah. they were looking up. You know, he had his hands on his head, and Lincoln yeah. came over and put his hand on his head. And I mean, when they, the, they, the they way that looked they were at like, his taking legs him off the anything. field, I was like, God, yeah. he, he's... It shouldn't be a surprise that... Half of the end, the offensive line is in the uh, top ten, right? No, no. Um, here's an interesting grade: Theo Weiss next to last. Which you know, I'm sure, they're, I'm sure he's getting dinged for a couple of drops. Sure, that he had tonight, and he did score the touch. But yeah, he disappeared for a big part of that game early. Um, but yeah, other than that, pretty much every. Andrew Rame here with 13 snaps and graded out very well. Anton Harrison, if you run in 37 snaps, he graded out very well. Um, yeah, I mean, that I, I, I will say that this, Eddie, I think receiving rotation is going to be something that's discussed a lot during the offseason. Yeah, and, you know, I, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what that group can come in and do from the 21 class. I mean, Jalil Farouk, Cody Jackson, can those guys come in and and uh, and, and be difference makers? Is Billy yeah. Bowman going to play some offense? I know that I've just left somebody out. Who did I leave out? Now I feel like an asshole at the wide receiver position. Um, God. I don't know. Our brains aren't working. It's, it, well, it's 3.40 in the morning, but... My apologies to the first five star out of Florida in the oh, history Mario of Williams. Rivals.com. Yeah, Mario <laughs> Williams. Oh, God. So, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I want to remind you guys go to EskridgeLexus.com. Uh, if you're looking for a new car, especially with the uh, holidays over and maybe thinking about starting to do some traveling as things are close to getting back to normal, uh, let them know that you're a Sooner Scoop subscriber, Sooner Scoop uh, podcast listener, uh, whether Unofficial 40 or the Eskridge Lexus post game. And uh, they've got great deals going on right now. All the two 2021s are in stock. Uh, and you'll get an even better deal by, by just telling them uh, you're a Scoop uh, listener. And uh, Ed Eskridge and the guys will take care of you. Ed, EskridgeLexus.com. Go check them out for more information, more contact information, inventory, all that stuff. Uh, I can't thank them enough for being such an integral part of our post-game pod. And uh, they make us happy to uh, stay up late on nights like tonight. Maybe not happy is the right word to put it because we're usually on a Saturday night and I don't have to do my radio show in two hours. But. It's just crazy to think that this thing's over. It doesn't feel like the season's over. It's because it doesn't feel like we really had a season. I know. We watch games from home for the first time. Tonight did feel like it was, I think Bob said it best, it, it felt like the old times. Yeah. We're in a hotel room. That rarely ever happens anymore. I know. Feels good. All right. Well, I've enjoyed it. Uh, yep. We will continue to uh, pod each and every week with the unofficial 40, so we're not going away there. Uh, but that's it. And it's hard to believe we're not talking about the Sooners losing out on a national championship appearance. It's been a while since we've 
ended the season. The the end of the, end of the season, season like uh, Lexus or uh, Eskridge Lexus uh, post game podcast has not ended well the last couple of years. No, no, <laughs> it's usually been like, the most the sad happened? sack podcast possible. <laughs> no doubt. But no, they ended up on a high note, and you know what? I think with the year that we've all had, that's not such a bad thing. Not at all. And you can leave going, I wonder how well they could have played against Alabama or Clemson or Ohio State. Not such a horrible thing to think maybe there was more there. Sure. Than you got to see. So, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it this season. We really appreciate you being a part of it. Uh, uh, Still another signing day to come. Uh, still a lot of figuring out who's coming, who's staying, who's going, who's transferring, uh, who's getting the boot, all of that. So plenty for us to keep reporting on. Uh, Jaden Hazelwood's saga will continue, no doubt. And uh, we'll continue to tell what we know about that on the Crimson Corner. So uh, stay tuned to Soonerscoop.com. It's, you know, end of a season, but it's the beginning of next season. And that all starts really almost immediately. So thanks for staying with us. We're glad to have you. Glad to... Uh, be able to do this for you each and every week during the season when there's games. Uh, and here's to maybe some normalcy. The next time we're doing the Eskridge Lexus po- postgame podcast, maybe life is just a little bit more normal. Maybe there are more people in the stands. Uh, maybe you're not worried about whether your favorite player is going to catch a virus and be out that week or close to somebody that had a virus and be out that week. That's what we all hope for. That's what we all wish for. And uh, can't wait to see you guys uh, when it gets more back to normal. Uh, right here on the Eskridge Lexus post-game podcast from Soonerscoop.com.